Hi, this is Nancy Gaberti from Total Wellness Empowerment Podcast, and I am so excited to have this amazing gentleman as my guest and speaker today. And we're actually doing two segments because he has so much to share, and you are going to positively be enhanced as well as empowered by these two segments. So I'm so excited to get started. First, let me intro him with his bio. Rob Call is an award-winning journalist, inventor, software architect, connector, visionary. He's the author of The Bottom Up Revolution, and you're gonna wanna hear all about that, mastering the emerging world of connectivity. He's given talks and workshops to Fortune 500 executives and national medical and psychological organizations, and he's pioneered the first of their kind conferences in positive psychology, brain science, and story. He hosts some of the world's smartest, most interesting, and powerful people on his bottom-up radio show. He's founded and publishes one of the top Google-ranked progressive news and opinion sites. And I'll spell that. The um, actual URL is opednews.com. Definitely check it out. And that site has over 23 million visitors. I'm going to include all his social media handles, but I really want him to come on and teach all of you how to live a better life and really learn everything that he's about. So welcome. I'm so happy to have you, Rob. It's a pleasure. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Tell me something about this. If people are not familiar with the bottom up um, revolution, if you can explain that you have a book about that and also um, the positivity with psychology and how people can um, change their life for the better. So here's the book, The Bottom Up Revolution, Mastering the, Mastering the Emerging World of Connectivity. Uh, and it's a book that I put together uh, after being fascinated with the idea of bottom up and uh, doing a radio show for 10 years where I interviewed thought leaders who had a take on bottom up. People like Jack Dorsey, the founder of Twitter, Craig Newmark, the founder of Craigslist, neuropsychologist, anthropologist, uh, and uh, I learned a lot. I really, it surprised me what I discovered. So uh, our plan is we're going to do a, a slideshow on that. And there were a couple of things that I put together in this. One is that happiness and, and having positive experiences are all about bottom up. And so are the hero's journey. The hero's journey is a concept that I'm going to get into that we all go through every time we go through a change. And it's, it's a myth told in a thousand different cultures. And it, it, if you understand it, it makes it a lot easier to, to go through change and recognize when you have opportunities to change. Bottom up is a concept that is, I believe, incredibly important. Uh, in, in, in Northern Canada, the, the people who live in Nunavut, where it's always snow, they have 50 words for snow because they need them to survive and to thrive. I really believe that we need to understand the concept of bottom up and top down, the opposite of bottom up, because it's such an important part of our lives. So what is bottom up? Most people really don't know what bottom up is, even people who talk about it. Uh, so it, it's the biggest trend in humanity's existence, not the history, the existence. It's just produced trillions uh, in, in new business. It's destroyed and wiped out industries. It's changed the nature of power, diplomacy, marketing, war, relationships, arts, the media. And the reason it's so powerful is because we evolved to be bottom up. We evolved to live in hunter-gatherer bands where everybody took care of each other, where everybody had to think about what they did in terms of how it would affect all the people they lived with because they cared about them because they had compassion for them, because they always worked together. And you couldn't think about doing something on your own. That didn't happen. So 
it, we have hundreds of genes that are bottom up genes and bottom up to me is a way of seeing, relating, being and doing in the world. It's, 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 it's a kind of way of seeing the world. And it actually gives us a kind of a metaphoric filter through which we view the world. I, I like to say, uh, I sign my books often, uh, made this book further open up your bottom up eyes. And, and that's what I hope that this talk will do for you too. The problem is civilization came along after literally millions of years of human existence and it repressed a lot of the, the aspects of being bottom up with hierarchy and centralization and domination and slavery. So we've had a lot of our bottom up nature repressed, but it's been coming back and it has changed us so that now we are becoming more bottom up again because the internet and smartphones have catalyzed the return to bottom up. History for about the last 40 years has, has switched. History used to be powerful people, generals, the wealthiest people, and it changed. Uh, Howard Zinn was one of the pioneers in it when he wrote his People's History in the United States, where he looked at the average person, at soldiers and farmers and workers, to give the history from that perspective. And there are a lot of books now out that are about bottom-up aspects of history. Matter of fact, if you go to a university history department now, they may have one top-down historian, but they're almost all bottom-up historians. And bottom-up history, when you teach people bottom-up history, it changes the way they think about their relationship to the world. If you're only teaching top-down history, then change happens by kings and generals and the wealthy. If you think of bottom-up history, you have the power to change the world. One thing that uh, was agreed upon by every neuroscientist I talked to and all the people born after 1980 is people born after 1980 have a different kind of brain. Mm -hmm. Their brains function differently and they see the world differently. They have a more bottom up view of the world. One part of it is they have the power to change their lives. Little kids, two years old, can, can work with iPads and smartphones now. That gives them a sense of empowerment that is very different, a sense of agency, self-agency. And it, 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 it just dominoes through the rest of their lives. So it's changed. These are some of the different categories of, of top-down and bottom-up char characteristics. Uh, there's, there, I have more of them in the book, The Bottom-Up Revolution, but there's a lot to bottom-up. It, it, it starts with just thinking about cooperation and interdependence. It's about sharing, about democratization, about being decentralized, connected versus detached, cooperative versus competitive, and the list goes on and on. It, it keeps going on. <laughs> and uh, the thing is, you live in a world where you experience bottom up stuff all the time and you may not think about it as bottom up you may think about it as grassroots or crowd sharing or wisdom of the crowd or crowdfunding uh, or social media or the comments on amazon and this is like the blind wise ones there they each go into a room and one says it's a tree trunk another says it's a rope another says it's a cow another says it's a hose another says it's a rug another says it's a spear but it's an elephant and and that's what bottom up is bottom up has all these different aspects and really people don't tie them all together so it's a paradigm shift this that we have returned to and it's a really powerful one that i believe is more powerful than the gutenberg press because it's something that is in our genes and it's hitting and and it's exploding on us because all those genes that we evolved that are bottom up have been there in us waiting to reawaken and the smartphone and the internet have done that and so it's back big time. And it affects the way you relate to people and the way you see things. You know, there are hundreds of millions of indigenous hunter gatherers still on this planet. So we know how they see the world and how they function. So we know a lot about what this bottom up nature is in, in indigenous cultures. One, one of the ways that I really learned a lot about it was through Darsha Narvaez, who wrote the book, uh, The Neurobiology and the Development of Human Morality. Uh, which which won the award, the um, William James Award from the American Psychological Association for being uh, the best book on psychology for the year for among psychologists, and it basically gets into this whole idea of how 
we have humans evolved to have this kind of primal nest of how people were raised before civilization and it was the optimal way for producing morality and the full human potential, which has been so much repressed now. And my goal for the book is to get people to develop greater connection consciousness, to be aware that we're all connected to each other and to nature and to all of the different systems that are in our lives. And, and that's something that, that was a natural thing for people who were uh, living in a hunter-gatherer world, or who do live in indigenous culture, but it's not for a modern civilization. What I want to talk about now is, is positive experiences. Positive experiences are basically the building blocks uh, of our capacity for happiness, love, deepening relationships, having relationships, facing challenges, dealing with ad adversity. Basically, I've got into it because I got into heartwarming. People who were having heartwarming experiences, I, I monitored their physiology using biofeedback equipment. And I found that everything worked. It, not that it worked, but it went, it worked better. Their muscles relaxed, their breathing calmed down, their heart rate calmed down. And I started asking them to give me examples of heartwarming experiences in their life. Everybody knows what a heartwarmer is. It's when you get that warm glow in your heart. Not, not everybody has them, but, but a, a lot of people do. People would give me examples of their heart warmers, and I would see ones that I didn't see as, as heartwarming, but they were all positive experiences. So I kind of broadened my perspective to think about positive experiences. And, and I've given this concept that positive experiences are so valuable to at least a thousand psychologists and psychiatrists and doctors, and every single one has agreed. And I've never had anybody who disagreed. And it, so it the logical conclusion is it's in our best interest to understand what makes positive experiences happen and to make them better, stronger, deeper, longer, and more meaningful in our lives and, and make the most out of them. Yeah, for sure. So what I came up with was an anatomy of positive experiences. Mm -hmm. And I came up with the concept that they are our most valuable possessions. You want to make a lot of money, why? So you can have more positive experiences. And that's what it's all about in this life. Some of the positive experiences we have are recovery. Some of them are recovering from problems. Some of them are cleaning out a drawer and feeling good about doing that. Some of them are about sharing a wonderful moment with your child or with your, your, pers your lover. There are all different kinds. And uh, basically, you can, I, I put together a list of them. I call it the call positive experience inventory uh, and actually don't use the, the link there. The one that you can get it at is robcall.com slash K-P-E-I. If you go to robcall, K-A-L-L.com slash K-P-E-I, you can get the, the positive experience inventory, which lists a couple hundred different categories and examples of positive experiences. And I'll get into why you want to use this. So, Basically, you want to have a lot of different kinds of positive experiences. I break it down into a collection of them. So this is the big picture for, for the different stages of the, the, the anatomy of positive experiences. I break it down into six parts. Be prepared for positive experiences mentally and physically. Then plan, schedule, research, and anticipate them then recognize, identify, initiate, and embrace them. In other words, know how to notice when you have an opportunity for one and then grab it. Then once you're having a positive experience, intensify and prolong it. Then make sure you encode it to memory so you'll remember it. And there are reasons that you don't always do that. And then integrate it and use the positive experience later. Those are the six steps. And now I'm going to go into them in more detail. One. Be prepared mentally and physically. Build strong, healthy reflexes, bounce, energy, and buoyancy. Get healthy because you need to be healthy in order to optimally have positive experiences. Imagine you see, you're walking down the street and you see a friend you haven't seen in 20 years drive by, pull up at a light 100 feet from you. You want to knock on that window. So you need to be able to run to that window. 
And if you can't, then you may miss that incredible opportunity. And there are lots of other opportunities that require extra energy. So you want to be able to have that energy. And, and that means you have to work to make that happen. So you want to be in really good shape, eat and sleep right, develop regular fitner, fitness habits, and, and, and invest in yourself so that you can have those positive experiences. Repetitively identify and affirm your strengths, goals, and dreams. Because if you know what you're looking for, you're going to be better at finding it. So ahead of the time, think about that stuff. Develop and seek social stabilizing positive factors in your life, people, things, activities, and avoid negative ones. You create your environment, you define it, and it can make a difference in how happy you're going to be and the kinds of positive experiences that you are open to finding. If you've got a lot of aggravation going on, if you've got people around you who are bringing you down, that can keep you from having them and finding them and seeing them. Another thing that I, I didn't really come to right away is that, but that I think is really important is have a clear set of values by which you may live a virtuous altruistic life with strong self-esteem. If, if you are doing things that are not virtuous, that are not honest, it's going to take away from your self-esteem and it's going to define you in a different way. And you're not going to feel like you deserve what you, you could deserve. So do that too. Be good. So be prepared mentally and physically. As, as the Dalai Lama says, practice warm heartedness. Be kind to people. Open yourself up to, to uh, empathy and, and compassion. Set a time to help others and make them happy. Uh, learn how to smile. There are all kinds of smile muscles. Uh, and this, this lists uh, a whole bunch of the front, them. The frontalis, which is the forehead. You don't want to frown you want to keep that relaxed you, the, the corner of your eyes is the is the, the muscle that is involved in in a genuine authentic smile it's when you crinkle your eyes with it like and give yourself crow's feet and then that's called the, called the orbicularis oculi pars palpebraeus really long one and i've got it learned memorized uh, reflexively <laughs> <laughs> and then there's this the main smile muscle the, the zygomaticus major and more muscles out there that are all part of having a smile. But the bottom line is give yourself a, 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 the power to have big, strong smiles. I've literally, when I've worked with some individuals, sent them home to do pumping smile iron exercises. I did some research with this working with people. And what I did was I'd tell them to smile as strong as they could. So try that now at home. Without anybody looking at you, you can feel safe doing it. Put a biggest smile as you can on your face. Work hard at it, harder, really hard. And I would do that with people. And I would have a, a, a biofeedback device measuring their, their electromyographic activity, the smile muscle electrical activity. And what I found was that if they did that, they'd get one reading, and then I would tell them to stop and relax and rest, and then we would talk and I'd get them to laugh. Now, mm -hmm. laughing is effortless, but the readings were twice as powerful as when they were trying as hard as they could. I, I think there's a, it's a metaphor in our lives. Mm -hmm. If you do something naturally from your heart, you can do it more powerfully than if you're trying and it's not a natural thing to do, but it's certainly the case with smiling. And there are smiles that are not on the face too. I've learned that having kids and grand, uh, grandchildren. Uh, little toddlers smile with their butts, they wiggle them. And, and big, bigger kids will pump their arms back with their, from their shoulders and their elbows to, to smile. So there are all kinds of ways to smile. You smile when you pull your head back and, and laugh with a belly laugh. Lots of ways to smile, and you want to really open yourself up to smiling with as many of those ways as you can. I love that. Then you want to be prepared mentally and physically, and approach and see others with love, compassion, and tolerance. Don't miss little opportunities to connect. Increase your eye contact, and speed up your response to the smile of strangers. I gave a talk at uh, Campbell Soup once, and one of the executives there described how she was a smile vampire. She would walk through the halls of the building and she would smile at people until they smile back. And uh, there's another way to be a smile vampire too. You can watch people smiling and then clone or duplicate their smiles and try them on for size. 
And that can be a very interesting and fun thing. It can be dangerous if you do it with their negative faces, but try it out and, and, and see if you can get people to smile. I mean, it, 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 it just feels good to do that. Cultivate positive expectancy, what psychiatrist Christian Hegeseth calls positive paranoia, expecting good things from the world. And go th try to go through your life like that. Good things are going to happen to you. Good things are ready to happen to you. Then give yourself and others a break and get organized. The better you do, job you do to organize your things and your time and your life, the more freedom you have and the more choices you have to do things that where you break out of your regular schedule. And learn to cope with life's hassles and adversity. Cognitive psychology teaches us that there are ways to talk to yourself so that instead of saying, oh my God, this is horrible, oh, this is the worst, you can say, eh, I can deal with this. This is, this is a hassle, but I can live with it. And, and learn how to have that kind of self-talk. There's an old classic book called Thoughts and Feelings that I strongly recommend that's very good for that. Uh, plan, schedule, research, and anticipate positive experiences. So people tend to plan and anticipate vacations. Mm -hmm. And that's great. But also try to schedule positive experiences into every day of your life, into your every weekend, into your evenings. They don't have to be really big things. They can be small things. They could be watering a plant or taking a, a five-minute walk outside. Uh, if you have a pet, walking your dog, or, or I know some people who walk their cat. Learn about your own positive experience patterns. Uh, when you download the, the KPEI, the Positive Experience Inventory, check it out. Look at what you do and look at what you don't do and start doing some of the things that you don't do that you could do. And then look at other people and things that they do and try to do some of them and try to expand what you're doing. The, uh, then learn about your environment and your nature. This is a very bottom up thing. Think about all the world around you and learn about it. Learn about the animals, the, the, the trees, the flowers, Learn about the different cultural things going on in your community and, and nearby you. And when you know those things, you can enjoy them more. But it takes a little research to do that. Again, listen, examine your dreams, your goals, your fantasies and projects, and use mental imagery and fantasy to visualize and rehearse them. And then one of my favorites, plan and prepare for unexpected opportunities. So one of the things that happens every year where I live is there are ducks walk around with their little ducklings in a row behind them. And it's just such a cute thing. And uh, I'll see it in, in maybe April, probably. And I, I've just given myself permission that, you know, I'm usually getting into the car, driving somewhere. If I see it, I give myself permission to stop what I'm doing, break out of my schedule, and take advantage of that unexpected positive experience opportunity. And I tell myself, this is one of those moments that I have given myself permission to do that with. Think that through. And then when you see one of those moments, just say to yourself, this is one of these moments. I'm taking care of myself here. I'm having a positive experience. Okay. Another thing is anticipate the pleasure of your plans. One of the great parts of positive experiences is before they happen, anticipating them. You know, if you can plan a vacation a year in advance, you've got a year of anticipation that adds to the pleasure of the positive experience. And you maybe talk about it with other people, talk about it with the person or the people you're doing it with, buy things for it, make things for it write things in your journal, all those things can add up to adding to the positive experience. So try to think ahead of time about the positive experiences that you're going to have. Thoreau said, if one advances confidently in the direction of his dreams and endeavors to live the life which he has imagined, he will meet with success unexpected in the common hours. The last thing is build skills and challenge them to produce flow. Mahali Chiksent Mahai wrote a book, Flow, and he's done a lot of research on it. And he's found that if people challenge themselves, they can often find themselves in a flow state where they lose track of time and they just really feel good about what they're working on, whether it's doing a painting or climbing a mountain. But you can do that with anything that challenges you. So create challenges in your life and create new ones. Take classes, go to lessons, and challenge yourself with new things to do because it will produce a flow state for you. Then learn how to recognize opportunities for positive experiences. Uh, 
let go, open your filters wide, do, do whole body smiling and work hard and give yourself permission to do nothing during which time you may find that something amazing comes out of it. Give your potential positive experiences a chance and kind of audition them. Something happens in front of you and you go, hey, this might be interesting. Well, pretend you're auditioning it and see if it, it's, it's good. Allow a little bit of chaos in your life and move, speed up, slow down, change your energy level. Again, study the positive experience inventory because it'll give you some ideas. Then empathize with and enjoy other people's positive experience. If you see somebody else laughing, enjoying themselves, see what it is. We have mirror neurons so that if we see somebody else having an emotional experience, we feel them too. Then you're in it. You're in the positive experience. You want to intensify and prolong it. And you want to add factors and elements to increase its complexity, its depth. If you're doing a relaxation exercise, if you increase the different senses that you include in your visual imagery, it'll increase the physiological response. So make it more sensory. If you're having a great experience, touch what you're sitting in and feel it. Touch the person next to you and connect with that person. And that can be a very powerful way to do it. A lot of, matter of fact, a lot of times people that have reported positive experiences, just the fact that they're doing something with somebody else makes it what is special about it. And a positive experience becomes more meaningful if you can connect it with some other parts of your life, what you care about, what is important, what you've done before, what someone else has done before. So if you can make the experience more meaningful, that'll make it more man memorable and it can make it deeper and it can help it to last longer and be stronger. Again, like connect with past positive experiences, connect with somebody heart to heart, uh, as well as just touching, the, just touching like the, the person's hand next to you. Boost the emotional intensity, smile more, and take a deep breath and let yourself be in it and maximize your multi multi-sensory awareness and using use enhancing self-talk. In other words, this is great. I love this. I'm feeling great. Wow. Mm. It doesn't have to be a word. It can be a sound. Just do things that actually help to boost the feeling of it. The next thing is you want to encode it to memory. The thing is, a lot of positive experiences, uh, especially like the heartwarming ones, the ones where you get chills up the back of your neck, they have endorphins, the natural opiates that our bo bodies produce involved in them. Endorphins were evolved to help us cope with, cope with pain just like people who are on a battlefield can keep on fighting. The way that works is when we have endorphin release, we don't always remember what happened during the time that the endorphins were released because it's associated with pain in one way. And so you may not remember it. So you want to, when you have a positive experience, keep a diary, keep a positive experience diary and write it down and keep your treasures there so that you can remember them. Uh, when my kids were little, I used to ask them each night, what, what, what made you happy today? What made you smile? What was fun? So you, you want to be able to do that. And you got to be careful because if you, if, you, if you grab the butterfly too tight, you'll kill the butterfly. But while you're having the positive experience, you want to try to be able to be aware that you are having it and remember. Uh, when you're done, just like if you're done exercising, you stretch to, to get your muscles uh, relaxed and loose. You want to do the same thing with a positive experience. You want to have a post-positive experience stretch. Uh, it was said that Whoopi Goldberg, when she received, uh, I think it was the Oscar, she said, thank you nicely. And then when she went back behind the stage, she screamed out and cursed and said, yay. So you can do the same thing. You get a job promotion and your boss says, hey, you're doing great. Uh, we're giving you a, a promotion. You go, thank you very much. Then you go out to your car and you go, yeah, 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 yeah. And you say it really loud. And then you want to record it and then tell, share it and tell others about it. Now, this is what's interesting is I, I do these workshops on, on positive experiences. And I tell people, if you share it, it feels great. When you tell other people about good experiences you, that you've had, it will often reactivate the good feelings that you had. And it'll often give you chills or thrills or a warm, heartwarming feeling in your heart. So many people are shy to do that. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it doesn't have to be bragging. 
it, it, but if you can tell other people about how happy it made you and the good feelings, it'll make you feel good. And if you do it right, it'll make them feel good too. And the only way to do it right is to just be real about it and authentic about it. And lastly, use the positive experience later. Transplant the thoughts or the feelings to new situations. Uh, you're going to have to give a speech. That's the thing that people fear the most. Think about being in a situation where you felt really comfortable, like with your kid or, or with somebody who, you, who really loves you. And look to the audience the way you look to that person who you love and clone the feelings. If you keep the positive experiences in your, in your life, it can strengthen your self-esteem and your positive attitude. It can be like a gyroscope that stabilizes you to, when you're facing adversity or challenges. And use mental Im imagery of these past positive moments for rehearsal for future moments as well. And that's the basics. Those are the basics of it. And, and you know, so much of positive experiencing is bottom up in that it is about connecting with other people, connecting with nature, connecting with your environment. It's not something you do by yourself, really. I mean, you can, but I mean, I've collected thousands of anecdotes of positive experiences, and most of them are either a connection with nature, a sharing, a connecting with other people, helping other people, giving to other people, Getting your life organized by getting your, your environment more organized. If you look at it that way, then what you're doing is you're making the world a better place too, as well as making yourself happier and adding to the most important wealth that you possess, which is your positive experiences. You have shared amazing information with the listeners and whoever's viewing this, this is something that they can view multiple times and get your book on and go to your website, which I'll have in the notes as well. All of what you said, I was like, amen. Can I just keep saying amen? Uh, it was, it just resonated because to live a fulfilled life, you basically gave the steps and that fights off dementia. Um, if they follow all your rules, it makes them mindful. Um, it can fight off depression. It can make them go for goals and strive for things that they would think that they could never do. Like all of that gives them, um, boost their self-esteem, their happiness, their purpose, their health of mind, body, spirit is really what you put together. When my kids were little, I would teach them there are a lot of, there are, there are so many things you can do that you've never done before. And I mean, that, that's through your whole life, really. You are, for some, sharing something that they haven't heard. And it's never too late. Anyone can get your book, watch what you're, you know, just presented and live that way. Now, it may not be easy because, you know, they get into self-doubt and negative talk. So is there anything that you can have them do to keep this in the forefront of their mind? They know habit and habit, right? Makes them stronger. But would they read your book or uh, listen to your show? Or is there something where they instill this on a daily basis? Well, uh, we start trying to plan. Every, there are a couple things. One, uh, the book goes into a lot more detail applying this model to connecting with other people. And I really think that connection with other people is one of the, and with nature. If you can do that, and if you can start connecting with other people and nature, and that can mean just taking a walk out in, among the trees. And, uh, you know, Nat Native Americans, they talk to trees. They have a relationship with nature that is, it's, 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 I guess they call it pantheism, but it's, it's really a way of seeing being connected. I mean, James Cam Cameron kind of characterized that in his movie Avatar as well, where he, he shows uh, Sigourney Weave Weaver actually testing the soil and seeing that it's alive and that everything's connected to each other. And now we know that, that in, 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 a, in a handful of soil, there are billions of living organisms <clears throat> that connect everybody together. Right. 
So it, it, again, it comes back to connection consciousness. Remember that you're connected to everybody in your life, all the cultural systems and nature, and do something with that. Be aware of it and, and remember to connect to it. It's so easy to just get stuck in the house watching Netflix. Get outside and, and, and connect with other people and find other people. You know, with Meetup and with listservs, there are so many ways to connect. You know, the best way is the old-fashioned way where you smell their breath and you see their faces. Uh, but keep keep trying to do it in as many ways as you can so make it your best life and so many people have to also realize that their health and their happiness is worth it because they are worth it so i thank you so much for being on this episode and i'd love for you to give a little teaser for our next episode where we will be discussing we're going to talk about the hero's journey. The hero's journey is an archetypal uh, myth that uh, Joseph Campbell wrote about in his book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, which has been described as the one of the most hundred influential books of the 20th century. And even before he wrote about it, it was called the monomyth, because it's a myth that almost every culture has that describes how we go through change in our lives. And it kind of maps it out. And if you if you have a map of the territory when you're going through changes, those changes can be finding out you have cancer, getting a new job, getting married, getting a divorce, uh, all kinds of things. Uh, and every movie, just 99.9% .9 of movies have hero's journey or character arcs where people go through the hero's journey. And it, what I've tried to do is, and what I'll be talking about is explaining the different stages of it and, and how you can use that understanding as a map to help you to better go through the changes in your life, the ones that are welcome, that you embrace, or that you, you have to accept anyway. So we are um, going to end this episode and get ready for the next 